So with that, I would like to um, call up someone that I met when she was still a student. Dr. Ludna Ahmad, PhD. She is the president and CEO of Envoy. Envoy is a medical device company that has developed a platform breath analyzer, the Voyager Breath Monitor, for medical applications and with its entrepreneurial team has achieved FDA clearance, raised venture capital, and engineered a user-friendly and robust device. Dr. Ahmad is the founder, CEO, a native of Arizona, and she completed the company while still in school completing her PhD in biomedical engineering. In the last three years, she has been successful in raising venture capital, getting a strong engineering team in place, and the business advisory board, getting her 510K clearance from the FDA, and developing the company's market product introduction strategy slated for execution later this year. Um, the first time I met this young woman was at Thai. She was a student. She was making one of her first presentations. And she sat down with me at a Mimi's restaurant in Chandler, Arizona, and said, this is what I'm going to do with my company. And she has followed every single step. Ladies and gentlemen, prepared to be impressed. Lubna, come on up. Uh, my name is Lubna Ahmad, and I am the founder and CEO of Envoy Technologies. Joan, do you have the thing? OK. I, I could actually talk probably with that slide for the next little while, but I'm guessing that you'd want to see some of the graphics. Um, Envoy is a medical device company, and as Joan mentioned, we have built a breath analysis device, so a device that you blow into to provide meaningful information about health and disease. Um, before we get into Envoy's specific product offering, I want to talk a little bit about breath analysis in general. So many of us know that there are lots of chemicals in the bloodstream. Okay? Um, some of those chemicals, a subset of them, are volatile. And what that means is that they evaporate readily. And so when the blood circulates and it comes in contact with the lungs, these chemicals volatilize, evaporate, into exhaled breath. So that's how they end up in the breath. So just like there are lots of chemicals in the blood, there are some 300 identified chemicals in exhaled breath. So at Envoy, what we've done is we've looked at those 300 chemicals, and like all good investor-based biotech startups do, we've prioritized them in terms of a number of different variables, clinical relevance, regulatory path, and of course our favorite market potential. And although we have an expansion and a vision for breath analysis as we move forward, we're really staying very focused on initially tackling metabolic disorders with the multi-analyte platform. Let's talk a little bit about metabolism. Many of us know that metabolic disorders in the United States are growing, and they're very, very serious. Most of the metabolic disorders start with the challenge of behavioral modifications that are necessary. So people need to make lifestyle changes in order for their metabolic disorders to be properly controlled. Speaking generally about metabolism, we all kind of intuitively know that there are three main energy sources that the body uses to drive energy. We get energy from carbs, from fat, and from protein. Okay, so we're going to couple those energy sources now with breath analytes. So oxygen and CO2 are chemicals that you can measure in exhaled breath. And what oxygen and CO2 do is they provide a percentage breakdown of your energy utilization from those three primary sources. Okay? But that's what they do. They provide just basically a percentage breakdown. So how much of your energy is coming from carbs, for example. To provide additional granularity superimposed upon oxygen and CO2, you can go up the fat metabolism vertical and measure acetone. So acetone is going to give more information on fat. How much fat is your body metabolizing in a given period of time? And then ammonia is basically the protein metabolism analog to acetone. And as you can probably guess from just a re quick review of the slide here, the body's energy utilization is going to change when a person is on a diet. It'll change during exercise, and it will change during disease. And this, of course, gives rise to different clinical needs, and it gives rise to corresponding different markets. OK, so so far what we've established or talked about is breath analysis is really cool. It allows for pain-free measurement, and it allows it's conducive to home monitoring. Right? And we've talked about metabolic disorders, huge market. This, of course, begs the question, why is it that we don't see breath analyzers on the market today that tackle these complex metabolic disorders. So I want to pause for a minute and talk about two main technical challenges that plague the breath analysis space. 
And so I'm going to apologize in advance if this gets a little tech savvy. I'm going to actually try to make sure that this is something that everybody can walk away with and understand. But in the blood, a lot of the, the chemical structures that we target are complex. Okay, so if you look at a glycoprotein, for example, if you look at a DNA molecule, you're able to target lots of different chemical moieties on a single chemical structure because they're large, complex molecules. In the breath, you don't really have that benefit. You're dealing with smaller molecules. They usually have one or possibly two functional groups. And so the, the literature and the work that has been developed in order to come up with good chemical recognition elements in the blood doesn't always translate into breath. So it was a big challenge for Invoy to tackle in terms of coming up with reactive chemistries that were good for a, a series of different analytes and exhaled breath. The second challenge pertains to usability. So we've talked a lot about, okay, breath analysis is pain-free, et cetera, but how do we get this to a point where it's really usable by an individual user? Okay, and let's talk about two examples here. An adult trombone player. If this person blows into a breath analyzer, now we'll talk about a two-year-old girl that just learned how to blow out birthday cake candles. This person blows into a breath analyzer. We're going to see fundamentally different levels of expiratory pressure, flow rates, volumes, things of that nature, and we somehow have to normalize them. So there are a lot of technical challenges that had to be addressed to be able to make breath analysis a successful um, venture. So what I have here is I've kind of broken up the next few slides to match up with, um, with Joan's theme of uh, discovery, development, and delivery. And on the discovery front, Envoy then went down a path of developing a number of different technologies with a really good group of bioengineers that were focused on sensor development with an eye to not being limited by what it has been done in terms of blood and urine. So you draw from that literature, but really kind of black box free think in terms of what it is that we can do that would be different. Um, we then looked at, we looked at a number of different sensor technologies. We looked at nanoparticles, um, enzyme-based sensors, electrochemical, we looked at thermoelectric. We looked at a number of different chemistries. We looked at aptamers, high enthalpy reactants, colorimetric reagents, et cetera. There were a number of different things that we looked at. And of course, those things serve to populate an engineering toolbox, but we can't develop all technologies to the same level of, of fruition. So we then had to, to use the, the term on the slide for all you math geeks out there, look at combinations and permutations of what was in the toolbox in order to figure out what the Voyager would ultimately become. We made our design decisions based on three primary objectives. The first objective was field readiness. The general translation was, let's not pick a sensor system that's prone to drift. Let's not pick a chemical system that has known stability issues. Objective two, affordability. Um, the general translation of that, let's go private pay. I mean, reimbursement is great, but we don't directly control reimbursement. And objective three was expansion potential. The general translation is let's not limit ourselves to one or two analytes. For anybody that's ever been involved in pivotal clinical studies, we can't always control whether an analyte pans out in terms of its clinical relevance. So in terms of the design decisions, we ultimately made some decisions and designed the Voyager breath analyzer. Um, the Voyager has been developed by Envoy. Um, we have one FDA clearance and we have a second one that is presently underway. Um, because the Voyager is still under review by the FDA, I'm not going to get into the specific clinical claims, but I, but I will say that it is being reviewed right now for use in both in a clinical setting as well as prescribed home use. So here's kind of how it works. Um, the user purchases a starter kit, and the starter kit gives them a base unit, so the blue device that you see on the screen. Okay, and then Envoy has five different disposable kits. And the disposable kits are basically cartridges, the cartridges that you see underneath the blue unit. So the doctor picks a disposable kit that is appropriate for the patient. So they select one of five kits for that particular patient. The Voyager is rapid. Um, the user gets information in a matter of minutes. It's portable. It fits in the palm of your hand. It's lightweight. It's pain-free. There's no needles. You just breathe into the device. And of course, it's multi-analyte, which allows you to get comprehensive information about a particular disease. Um, Obviously, from a business model perspective, the Voyager is a one-time purchase and the disposable serve as the source of recurring revenue. Okay, in terms of discovery to development, um, I wanted to talk about two things that helped us get from the engineering toolbox to the Voyager. And those two things are going to be infrastructure and team. On the infrastructure front, Envoy started off in a 1,500-square-foot office. It was in Southeast Chandler. It was basically kind of like a revamped medical office. The challenges are that we put in place um, a quality system. Those of you who are familiar with quality systems know that takes a lot of work. So it was an ISO 13485 um, compliant system, as well as one that was compliant with the um, 820 regs. When we were in that office, we had a great opportunity to figure out all the things we did not like about the office that we had. 
And we really wanted to kind of start over with a new space. And the city of Chandler provided us with that opportunity. So we moved over to um, the city of Chandler's um, Innovations Incubator. We have a 4,000 square foot suite over there now. And that's been great in terms of allowing us to put in place the facilities controls that we thought were useful, not only in terms of workflow, but also in terms of little things like subconscious messages to, to people that work there. When you're on tiled space or when you see colored walls, that means you're working in an environment with heightened control. So things of that nature were really important to us. Um, we do our own patient testing. We run our own clinicals out of our office. So we have a patient suite and we have um, a private patient entrance. And we've also been able to lay out a simulated manufacturing environment. That's been great, not only in terms of allowing us to um, you know, have a good sense of our design controls, but it's also been um, very useful in terms of estimating time for assembly of custom components, which is really great information to have when you're sitting down with a uh, manufacturing partner or supplier. On the team front, um, I think Envoy basically did everything backwards on the team. So we started off with a very young team, um, a, a group of people that really had not had a job previously. So Envoy's core team started off with an average age of 28. Okay, and that's very uncommon in the biotech space. Those of you that are, of course, familiar with IT industries or the tech industry, that's sometimes a little bit more common. But in the biotech space, it's not necessarily common to have that kind of a team. Um, and um, what we did then, for purposes of my own development as CEO, as well as to aid in our commercialization efforts, is we recruited some absolutely fantastic advisors. So Greg Garcia is here in the audience with us today. Um, we um, joined our advisory board with uh, Dr. James Gavin, who's the former president of the American Diabetes Association. And then we really raided a number of excellent people out of Octane, Orange County's Entrepreneurial Society. So Tom Berryman and Brian Stern um, have been absolutely fantastic on the commercialization front. Um, I do want to comment on the fact that I think we've got a really unique combination of people at this point. We've got a very young, high energy entrepreneurial team coupled with advisors that, for lack of a better term, provide meaningful adult supervision um, and in a way that's, that's positive, so without quashing the spirit and the drive to really make things happen. I think that's been really great. Um, the last two slides are going to focus on the delivery phase. As I mentioned, we are still waiting for our final FDA clearance, so we're not formally selling at this point. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, where we're going next. So um, the top two images on this slide here are borrowed from Kimberly Trotman's off-site design controls presentation that everybody that's ever been to an FDA seminar has seen. Um, and generally speaking, the FDA parlance, we have three phases that companies go through, a research phase, a development phase, and a production phase. And those are kind of analogous to, to, to Joan's phrases here at AZ Bio of, um, discovery, development, and delivery. The challenge with bootstrap startups that's a big deal when you're raising investment capital is that these phases are not chronologically separate. Nor, not only are they not chronologically separate, but you have the same people that are usually migrating through those phases. And so to be able to deal with the escalating levels of controls, where you've got level of control one, two, and three, perhaps on the same day, requires a very, very significant investment in quality and regulatory training across the entire team. And the reason I bring that up is because for people that are raising investment capital, um, when they're trying to bootstrap a company, it becomes so important to have that conversation with investors up front, that innovation can happen and should happen within a quality and regulated framework, but it's important to have that conversation up front. Um, so that's just, I guess, a lesson that we've learned. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about then on the delivery phase was kind of the way Invoice product fits in in the global market. So we fit within what's referred to as the global IVD market, that's in vitro diagnostics, and then more narrowly within point of care and over-the-counter products. This market's generally large, but it's populated basically with three products, right? At home, people right now, they use glucose tests, ovulation, and pregnancy tests. I mean, there's a couple of other tests, but generally speaking, it's those three. So what, what the Voyager does is it capitalizes on recent healthcare trends, right? We see the transition now from diagnostic tools to the four Ps, right? We want to see predictive, preventative, and patient participation in their own healthcare. Home monitoring, of course, is gaining a lot of traction as well. And we always talk about that. We always talk about patient participation being something that is so incredibly critical. And I think doctors play a huge role, don't get me wrong about this, um, what physicians are able to do after 30-hour calls in residency for years and decades of training and whatnot in terms of complex and critical disease management is absolutely essential. 
But in parallel with that, when it comes to the day-to-day -day decisions about what someone eats and the long-standing implications of those decisions, the patient has got to participate in the decision making. The future of metabolic disease management cannot simply lie with better drugs and with glucose meters that draw a little bit less blood than their predecessors. The future of metabolic disease management has got to involve a paradigm shift towards the patient being able to be trained to make data-driven decisions about the three experiments, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that they conduct every single day. The future of metabolic disease management has got to involve the advent of new technologies that have been designed with human factors in mind from the get-go, that are FDA cleared, that are clinically established and approved for use, but that involve the patient as an active participant in jump-starting their individualized health needs. We believe that Envoy will play a major part in this future, and I want to thank you all so much for allowing us the opportunity to share our story and our aspirations. Thank you.